This slideshow is aimed at showing you the basic skills required of a respiratory examination during an eight minute OSCE station. It should be used in conjunction with the accompanying video and most importantly practiced on as many patients as possible. On entering the station present your library card to the examiner and then begin. Introduce yourself to the patient with your full name and your position. Confirm that you have the correct patient and how they like to be addressed. Explain that because of their condition it is necessary to examine their chest but in order to do this you will also have to examine their hands, neck, face, back and legs. Gain their verbal consent and ask if they mind you talking to the examiner throughout the examination. Ensure that the curtains or screen are closed and ensure their dignity is respected. Ask the patient to undress completely from the waist upwards. Adjust the bed or couch to an angle of 45 degrees and ensure that the patient is comfortable in this position. Explain to the examiner that in the ward setting you are looking around the bed for oxygen therapy, nebulizers, inhalers, sputum pots and peak flow meters. Try to avoid looking in an exaggerated way around the bed area. For general inspection, stand at the end of the bed and give the examiner your overall impression of the patient. Look at the patient's general appearance. Note any weight loss. Is the patient breathless at rest or from the effort of removing his clothes? Are the lips pursed, as in COPD? Is there any evidence of central cyanosis? Are the accessory muscles being used during breathing, which can occur in COPD? Listen to the breathing with an unaided ear to hear if expiration is more prolonged than inspiration, which occurs in COPD. Are there any other noises, such as stridor, which is an inspiratory noise due to incomplete obstruction to airflow within the upper respiratory tract? When examining the hands, always compare right with left. Look at the hands for nicotine staining, peripheral cyanosis, finger clubbing, wasting of small muscles of the hands and tremor. Finger clubbing is most commonly found in lung cancer, fibrosis or chronic infection such as cystic fibrosis and lung abscess. Peripheral cyanosis is a bluish discoloration usually seen in the fingers and toes. It is characteristically seen in patients with circulatory disorders or in patients exposed to the cold but can occur in patients with severe central cyanosis. The peripheries in respiratory patients with severe central cyanosis are usually warm, but in those with circulatory problems, the hands are usually cold. Nicotine staining is typically a brownish stain on the fingers and nails in cigarette smokers caused by tar and not nicotine. When looking for finger clubbing, look for the four features. Loss of nail bed angle, which can be seen by looking across the nail and nail bed. Increased nail bed fluctuation. Increased bulk of soft tissue over the terminal phalanges. Increased nail curvature, which is a later stage. Hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy is discussed later. When examining for clubbing, show the examiner you are looking across the nail and nail bed angle. This is normally obtuse but disappears in early finger clubbing. Place your thumbs under the pulp of the terminal phalanx and attempt to move the nail within the nail bed using your index finger as shown in the picture on the slide. The spongy feel confirms nail bed fluctuation. Hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy is a feature of patients who have finger clubbing and results in painful swelling of the wrists and ankles and other joints. In examining for hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, ask the patient if they have any pain in their wrists and then gently press over their wrist to identify any tenderness. Check for a fine tremor of the hands when the patient is at rest. This may be due to an excessive use of beta agonists such as salbutamol or theophylline medication. Then look for asterixis, which is a coarse flapping tremor seen in severe carbon dioxide retention and respiratory failure. Ask the patient to put their hands straight out in front of them and cock their wrists back. 
watch for a few seconds for a jerky flapping tremor. The slide also describes other features of carbon dioxide retention. Next, check the radial pulse, palpate the radial pulse for 15 seconds if it is regular or for 30 seconds if it is irregular and note the rate. Once you have estimated the rate of the pulse, it is now necessary to measure the patient's respiratory rate. This should be done whilst taking the patient's pulse so the patient is unaware that the respiratory rate is being measured as this may make them anxious. When looking for anemia, look at both eyes. Tell the patient I would like to have a look at your eyes before pulling down one of the lower lids to check for conjunctival pallor. When examining for central cyanosis, ask the patient to stick their tongue out and lift it upwards and examine under the tongue. Central cyanosis is a bluish discoloration of the skin and mucous membranes caused by an absolute concentration of deoxygenated haemoglobin of greater than 50 grams per litre. If a patient is centrally cyanosed, they will automatically be peripherally cyanosed also. Note the converse is not true. Conditions such as Raynaud's phenomenon cause a sluggish circulation in the extremities, resulting in a patient who is in peripheral cyanosis only. When assessing the JVP, the patient should be sitting at 45 degrees with their head resting back on a pillow and turned slightly to the left. In this position, the right internal jugular vein should just be visible between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid. Make sure there is a good light source. The JVP is raised if the vertical height of the pulse above the sternal angle is greater than four centimetres. The JVP should be impalpable and obliterated by pressure at the root of the neck, except in severe tricuspid regurgitation. It should fall during inspiration and rise during expiration. Pressing over the liver for up to 15 seconds should elicit a rise in the JVP. This is known as the hepatojugular reflux. Before pressing over the liver, check that the patient does not have any abdominal pain. When assessing the height of the JVP, you measure the vertical distance from the sternal angle to the top of the pulsation. The normal JVP should be less than 4 cm. This should be expressed as so many centimetres raised as you must add 5 cm to the visible JVP to give the actual JVP. For the respiratory examination, the JVP is raised in core pulmonale and superior vena cava obstruction. When examining the lymph nodes, these should be examined from behind with the patient sitting upright. Start off by asking the patient, would it be possible for you to sit up so I can examine the glands in your neck? Start off by placing the fingers in the submental region under the chin, work backwards and laterally feeling the submandular glands and finishing behind the ears where you may detect enlarged posterior auricular nodes. Then place the fingers just medial to the top of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Work down the medial border of the muscle, palpating the cervical lymph node chain. Note the size and consistency of any palpable node and whether it is fixed to surrounding structures. Then feel for the scalene nodes above the first rib next to insertion of the scalenous anterior muscle with the patient's head slightly tilted to that side. Place your index finger between the clavicle and sternocleidomastoid muscle and then press down gently towards the first rib. A palpable scalene node is a soft mobile mass just above the hard first rib. Note the size and consistency of any palpable nodes and whether it is fixed to surrounding structures. Before attempting to check that the trachea is central, ask the patient I would like to press on your windpipe, it may be a little bit uncomfortable. This is important information, as otherwise the patient may be startled by you suddenly placing your fingers on their neck. Place the index and ring fingers over the manubrium sternae, over the prominent points on either side, 
and use the middle finger as the exploring finger to feel the tracheal rings for tracheal deviation. Now check the cricosternal distance. This is the distance between the cricoid cartilage and the suprasternal notch. It is usually three or more fingers breadth and is shortened in hyperinflation. Now inspect the patient's chest, uncover the patient and inspect the, the shape. Look for scars such as pneumonectomy scars as above, chest strains or chest strain scars and radiotherapy tattoos. Check for intercostal recession, the indrawing of intercostal spaces as the patient breathes in. Also note whether the movement of the chest wall is symmetrical. If it isn't, the pathology lies on the side of restricted movement. When looking at the chest wall, you may see a barrel-shaped chest, as in this slide, which is seen in conditions causing chronic lung hyperinflation, such as asthma and COPD. Note the increased anterior-posterior diameter of the chest and a tracheal tug is often present. Kyphosis is an increased forwards spinal convexity. It can cause problems with lung ventilation. Scoliosis is an increased lateral curvature of the spine. Pectus carinatum or pigeon chest is usually used to describe a chest where the sternum is prominent. It is caused by chronic childhood asthma and rickets. Patients who have suffered from chronic childhood asthma rickets may also have Harrison's sulcus. This is a groove deformity of the lower ribs at the point of the attachment to the diaphragm. Pectus excavatum, also known as sunken or funnel chest, is a congenital chest wall deformity in which several ribs and the sternum grow abnormally, producing a concave or caved-in appearance in the anterior chest wall. It can later result in respiratory problems. Superior vena cava obstruction is usually the result of the direct obstruction of the superior vena cava by malignancy, most commonly lung cancer. The obstruction of the superior vena cava results in a raised and non-pulsatile JVP with an absent hepatojugular reflux and dilated veins over the neck and chest wall. Other causes include lymphoma, thymoma and mediastinal fibrosis.